Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, so this is the second lecture we have in our time series database lectures. Uh, so today we have Karthik from Streamlio. Prior to starting the startup five months ago, uh, he was the uh, sort of the program manager of the Heron project at Twitter. Um, that's the new streaming system that, that Twitter developed. And then prior to that, he had a startup with Jignesh Patel from Wisconsin on called Lo Locomatics that was bought by Twitter, and that's why he ended up there. Uh, so Karthik has been sort of well-known in the database community for a while because he did his PhD at the University of Wisconsin with Jeff Naughton and the database people there. So we're super happy to have, have him talk about the, the new system that they're building. Well, thank you. Thanks, Andy, for the short intro. And also thanks for setting it up. And it's a pleasure to be here. This is my second visit, I believe. The last time when I visited, it was 2014 or so for a recruiting trip that I came and I gave a talk at the CS department and uh, grabbed a few students, but unfortunately they didn't join. <laughs> so anyway, so the title of my talk will be Autopiloting Real-Time Processing with uh, Heron. And Heron is one of the systems that we developed uh, to Twitter when we were uh, while I was there before I started a company based on Heron and a few other things. Uh, so this is a joint work with uh, Microsoft folks and uh, Twitter folks. So, so Aurelia was leading on the Microsoft side and uh, Bill and I was leading on the uh, Twitter side. So um, again, this talk is about uh, uh, most of our uh, practical experience that we uh, uh, encounter every day to day in the operating real-time systems at uh, Twitter. So that's what this the whole talk is and uh, what are the problems that we found and uh, we are trying to uh, solve that problem in an automated fashion and that is all the talk is about. So what is autopiloting? So like, oh sorry, I think the animation is kind of this thing. So an autopilot is, according to Wikipedia, is a system to control the trajectory of an aircraft without any constant hands-on control by a human operator. And tweaking it a little bit in our system settings, you want an autopiloting, autopiloting a real-time system means its ability to adapt to itself as its environment changes without any manual intervention. That is the whole idea of autopiloting. So why we need autopiloting? Because in uh, real time systems, the value of, uh, you have to look at how the value of data to its decision making decreases over a period of time. So the value of data to decision making is the highest the moment, the instant it is produced. As it ages, uh, the value goes down. And uh, when the data is at its highest value, you want to make time critical decisions. And uh, if you wanted to make time critical decisions, for example, if you're in a financial trading application where if stock price exceeds a certain limit, you wanted to execute an action saying that you either sell a stock or buy a stock. So, so in order to execute these time critical decisions, you have to make sure that your systems run continuously in an, some kind of autopiloting mode so that uh, you don't need any manual intervention. Because the moment you start having manual intervention, there is a chance that you lose the liveliness of the data and the action is very much delayed. So the, the second reason why we have to do autopiloting is, uh, from an enterprise perspective, is loss of revenue. For example, think about the downtime impact, especially during popular events like uh, Super Bowl as well as Oscars, because Twitter makes its most of the uh, money during that ad time within that four hour period, right? So during that, if there is a, even a few moments of downtime, it can lead to millions of dollars lost in revenue. And of course, there is SLA violations. So Twitter uh, typically have deals with their partners and uh, ad partners who are generating revenue for us that if it's down for some amount of time, then we have to pay a lot of hefty penalty. So we want to avoid that. And finally, like quality of life. This is very important, actually. So if you get constant uh, pagers going up in the middle of the night, like 2 a.m., 3 a.m., or during when I'm uh, an engineer is in, uh, enjoying the Oscars, you might want to reduce the, your incident time because th that improves the quality of life for people who are working on these systems. And finally, like it's increased productivity. So when uh, engineers don't uh, constantly do firefighting in terms of incident and SREs, they can develop good features for the product and make the product better and better and better. So that's why we increased productivity. So that's the reason, another reason why autopiloting uh, system is required. So before I go into what I mean by autopiloting and what are the issues that we encounter in, uh, real, in uh, practical uh, experience, I just want to give an introduction to Heron, so because I think, uh, how many of you know about Heron actually? So I think it makes sense to just give a few slides about what Heron actually means. So. 
is Twitter Heron is nothing but a streaming platform for processing real time data as they arrive so that you can react to it a real data as it happens so that you can act on the data and if you want to make any decisions based on the real time data you can do all kind of stuff and uh, so it has a bunch of properties. One is uh, it provides uh, guaranteed message passing. In a streaming system, there are uh, three different message passing guarantees that we need to provide. One is uh, at most once where you try to do the best effort processing, at least once where you guarantee that the uh, data is processed at least once, but it could be processed more than once, and exactly once, which essentially means like uh, you have to process the data only once, and it's also its consequences too. Uh, so the second uh, aspect is scalability. So, and um, by the time I left Twitter, like uh, Heron was running on thousand plus nodes. So you might, so like if uh, those capacities are filling up, you just keep adding nodes to it, and automatically the software should uh, take into account the new nodes and st start spawning jobs on those new nodes as well. Then it has to have robust fault tolerance in the sense like uh, in the presence of uh, process failures, machine failures, automatically the software should keep going, again, without any manual intervention. Then finally, like it has a way to express computations in uh, a concise logic in the sense like you can uh, do it at multiple levels, uh, at a lower level as well as a functional level as well as a, a declarative level. So, so with the various levels of ways by which you can express the computation, it becomes easy to uh, submit a uh, your uh, computation logic and submit it. So to introduce a simple few terminologies, like uh, a Heron job is a streaming job is called a topology, and a topology is nothing but a DAG. And there are two type of vertices in a DAG, and uh, the one is called the spouts, which are essentially taps into the sources of data and inject the data into the topology. And then the bowls are the different another type of vertices, and uh, they essentially are more computational elements where. They take the input data, do some uh, computation on the data, then they emit outgoing data. And some of the examples include uh, filtering, aggregation, joins, <coughs> typical any typical database functions, or it could be even an arbitrary machine learning function like clusterings uh, or uh, association rule mining, all kind of stuff like that. And the edges between those uh, vertices represents uh, streams of flow of data going from uh, one vertice to another vertice. To give an example of uh, how a topology looks like, like you can have a couple of spouts here, uh, then th those are in turn feeding into a bunch of bowls in the next stage, and that in turn, uh, bowls in turn transform the data in some form and pass on to the next stage of bowls. The one big difference between MapReduce and uh, Heron topologies are that you can have arbitrary number of stages in uh, Heron actually as compared to MapReduce, where MapReduce is actually two stages, map and reduce, and you have to have another map and reduce, so that becomes two different jobs. So here you can have as many stages as you, you as you can so now the when this topology physically gets executed so as you all know data is pretty uh, has high growth because uh, enterprises grow the data by 40 percent every year and because of the high data growth uh, it's easily you can exceed the limitation of what you can process within a single machine so which means we have to go distributed and uh, do kind of partitioning so when the inherent topology is execute in uh, in the underlying hardware so each of the spout and the uh, bolt will have this notion of uh, parallelism or each one can have multiple instances of them running in different nodes so that they can sustain the, pro uh, the data that is being generated. So if uh, data is being generated like one terabyte per second, yes, you can have uh, with so many partitions of the data, you can continue to process them. So essentially, like this is essentially what we call as a parallelism, and uh, the spout and bolts are sometimes referred as components. And the component parallelism essentially means the number of instances that you have to do per uh, vertice, per vertex. So then, uh, now the one thing is like uh, when you have these uh, mul um, um, parallelism involved, now how the data from uh, emanating from one spout instance goes into another bolt instance and so on. So that's where the notion of uh, grouping comes in. So a simple, uh, the Heron supports multiple different groupings. One is called the shuffle grouping where you can send it to any downstream bolts and the fields grouping essentially is similar to hash partitioning where you just pick up a few uh, fields and compute a hash function out of a uh, use a hash function to compute a hash value and by based on the hash value wherever the, the destination is it will go to the do that bolt then all grouping essentially replicates to everybody downstream then global grouping sends the entire stream into only one task 
So, if you go back to the physical execution and uh, uh, annotate it with a grouping, you can have a topology like this, where the spout one is feeding into bolt one using sort of uh, shuffle grouping, and similarly, uh, you can do spout two to bolt three is using fields grouping. It's a combination of those, right? So they, this uh, essentially allows you to route the data in uh, different forms. So now, how do you generate a heron topology? How do you write a heron topology? There are multiple ways you can do it. And one is uh, more procedural and low level API. You write directly your code on as a spout and bolt, that's it. So this is a very useful for uh, several occasions where people process uh, a video data, break that video into multiple smaller segments and uh, throw into multiple stages. Uh, then you can do even, uh, the second level is called functional, which is more of a use of maps and flat maps and and, uh, transforms functions and windows is like more of uh, Scala like functional then a declarative which is SQL which we are not finished it yet but it's coming and uh, you can just say what you want and the uh, system will know how to find it so so with that like I'll go into the high-level heron architecture so that uh, the further uh, portion of the talk you can understand it better so heron per se does not have a scheduler of its own because the reason why we design uh, like that is because uh, uh, in the open source community, the uh, scheduler community is pretty strong. There are a lot of uh, very good quality schedulers that are already available in the market. I mean, one of them is uh, Kubernetes. There's a huge momentum behind it. And similarly, uh, Mesos uh, is another scheduler that's already has a lot of momentum. Then Yawn also is another scheduler. So instead of reinventing the wheel and having a ton of scheduler that we need to uh, work on, uh, we decided to piggyback on an existing schedule. Scheduler, so that uh, when you uh, when you submit a heron job, it will act like, like a ton of uh, job for any scheduler. So one of the beauty of the heron architecture is what we call as an extensible architecture and completely modularized. And uh, the reason why we modularized is because uh, in the big data ecosystem, constantly things are changing. People come up with new schedulers. People come up with the new uh, what do you call as a zookeeper like synchronizing uh, software. Then um, storage changes on today's Hadoop, tomorrow is a SAF, a cluster, a GF, a FS, those kind of different file systems keep coming up. So how do you make sure that uh, your code does not change in the constant uh, environment that is continuously changing? So Heron has this modularization so that you can write your plugins for each one of these different components and Heron will automatically take into account. So that way what happens is like unlike other popular open sources like uh, Spark, Storm, where they have different code bases for different schedulers, Heron has one single code base which accommodates all these plugins and you just to turn on the plugin when you're doing installation time automatically takes care of everything. So anyway, coming back to the architecture, like uh, it does not have a scheduler of its own and um, so it, it looks like yet another job in the scheduler. So the advantage of doing this is if you already have a big cluster, like a Yarn cluster, Mesos or a Kubernetes cluster already you're running, all you have to do is compile your job and just launch it and uh, then uh, it looked like yet another Kubernetes job and runs. So now uh, going down into a little bit more detail about the Heron topology components. So Heron uh, runs in terms of the uh, uh, what you call containers. A Heron job is nothing but a set of containers and uh, the containers could be either mapped into a Linux C groups or you can map into a more of a Docker container also. So it, both are possible. And uh, so the, there is a special container called the master container. And uh, within the master container, there is a, a, a process called topology master, which governs that entire topology that is running. And uh, then there are the rest of the containers are called data containers where the actual data is being processed and the data containers uh, could be as many as uh, uh, hundreds and tens and hundreds and thousands. So we have pushed it up to one job having around thousand containers so far and definitely we can even push it up to a few thousand containers. The only thing is like uh, limitation is will be the n square socket problem. Uh, so if you have thousand containers, each con container has to connect to the other containers so that yeah, they can do data exchange. Uh, so before uh, going into those details, like let me describe uh, what is inside the contain data container. So the data containers in turn consist of uh, several processes and uh, some of the, uh, one of the critical processes is called the stream manager. And the stream manager is responsible for routing data between data containers. And uh, 
then the metrics manager is essentially responsible for collecting all the metrics that is being originated out of this so that you can do some kind of a troubleshooting what's and uh, kind of visible into what is happening with the topology right now uh, so this is very useful for troubleshooting and the instances i1 and i2 and i3 these are the processes which actually run your uh, spout and the bolt code that uh, remember we, we talked a few slides ago where we talked about spouts and bolts and that code is essentially runs on these uh, instances so so the sequence is like uh, first when the topology gets started the master container comes up then uh, um, based on the amount of request uh, resources that it requires uh, it requests a scheduler hey can you please spawn off uh, like thousand containers for me uh, once uh, the thousand containers are spawned off by the scheduler then uh, the each of the uh, containers will start the stream manager as a first process and uh, that in turn will uh, immediately try to find where my topology master is so so they are able to discover topology master using a zookeeper the zookeeper is used for a, a service discovery kind of equivalent where the topology master when it comes up it tells that i am available on this host a and port b and so then once all the data containers stream manager comes up they look at the uh, fixed place in the zookeeper based on the topology name then they contact the topology master saying that uh, i have come up in this container the moment every container comes up and reports uh, to a topology master saying that hey, i am all okay then topology um, master forms what you call as a physical plan so the physical plan essentially gets you information about uh, where the other containers are running so that uh, each container will receive that physical plan and they in turn will know where the other containers are running so that they can connect to it because ultimately data exchange has to happen between all the containers right so there should be some way for the containers to discover each other and that is through the physical plan so once the physical plan is uh, uh, broadcast every to all the containers they will connect uh, with uh, each other and start transmitting data so now uh, there are multiple ways the data transmission occurs so data can emanate out of the instances and it could be going to instances in the same container so which means uh, the instances do not interact with each other to keep the software simple and predictable the data bounces off from the stream manager even though it is local for the container so like it so in this case what will happen is if i1 data has to go to i4 it will go to the stream manager on the container then get back to i4 and similarly the next uh, data exchange is if uh, data from i1 here has to go to the i1 in the other container it goes via to stream manager from that stream manager it goes to the other stream manager which in turn delivers the data to the i1 so so one of the basic difference between the rest of the other streaming frameworks and the heron streaming frame uh, heron uh, streaming is it's a more process oriented architecture rather than a threaded thread oriented architecture and process oriented architecture gives a lot of uh, flexibilities because it has uh, isolation so each instance could be restarted whenever you want to if there is some issues with that and uh, because of the fact that it's containerized each container can be restarted separately and uh, the whole topology does not influence any other topology that you are running and this is all very essential uh, in a, a comp in an enterprise setting where one job does not pull out another job because you don't want to share anything at all so so any questions so far because this is very important in uh, this thing yes uh, so does Heron actually optimize the topology to reduce data movement or to push down the logic? So currently, like it doesn't. Repeat the question. Repeat. Oh, okay. So the question is whether uh, Heron uh, optimizes uh, uh, data movement uh, based on the topology. So currently, it doesn't at this point because uh, it's a little bit of a lower level API, but. Uh, if you wanted to optimize the data movement it's possible to do but it also depends on uh, there is a notion of a, what you call a packing algorithm so what happens is how do you pack this spout and this board is going into this container compared to that spout and the other spout right so how do, so the packing algorithm has a heavy influence on how the data movement occurs yeah you can come up with the uh, intelligent packing algorithm that depends on the uh, topology DAG. So and, and there's also like because the question like you can also push down the bolts right like in SQL you push down the predicates. Yes, you could push down the uh, uh, predicates of wherever evaluation as far as close to the source right. The source are nothing but the spouts right. So <laughs> the, you can reduce the number of bolts that is being generated yes. So the DSL that we have done uh, currently it doesn't do the optimization because optimizer is a completely a whole area that you can write. It's, we have not touched anything at this. That's why 
Oh, if you guys folks are interested in doing it, go for it. <laughs> okay? Yes. Could you tell what the Zookeeper cluster is used for? So, Zookeeper cluster is used for uh, what do you call uh, the um, discovery. So, essentially, when the topology master comes up, uh, it writes its location in the Zookeeper uh, so that uh, uh, other containers can discover where the topology master is. Then the second usage is which I forgot to mention is uh, once a physical plan is formed, when everybody reports and uh, says that I'm okay, and uh, it records the location of the containers, right? And that information is also saved in the Zookeeper. The reason why we save it in the Zookeeper is the master container can go down at any given time. So, because uh, then if the master container goes down and uh, scheduler brings up a master container in a different node, then the master container can discover its uh, state and or uh, uh, re-bootstrap itself from the state whatever it is left off. So, is this common across jobs or is this? Uh, the Zookeeper cluster is shared. So, Zookeeper cluster is uh, typically is uh, used for uh, several softwares and then Hadoop as well as uh, other bunch of other softwares he in turn uses it. So, typically a Zookeeper uh, a team maintains that uh, Zookeeper cluster. So, any other questions before I move further? Yes. Um, so, what will happen if a container is jump or uh, mal behaving like uh, it's very slow due to some hardware like uh, issues? Okay, so the uh, question is, uh, what happens if a container goes down? So, yes, it's a valid question. So, like, uh, let us uh, take the two cases. One is the master container can go down or any of the data containers can go down. Those are the two cases, right? So, what happens in the case if your data container goes down? So, when the data container goes down, so what happens is, like, uh, there is a heartbeat mechanism that goes between stream manager and the topology master. So, the topology master figures out that this container has gone down. So, and there is another heartbeat mechanism that goes between the container as well as the scheduler as well. So, now uh, scheduler looks at it and says, sees that this container is down. So, it will relocate the container to another machine or probably on the same machine, whatever might be the case. Then the container will come back up. Then the container again, the first job is going to discover where my topology master is at any given point in time because topology master knows that I have not got the heartbeat from this container anymore. Now, when this container starts up, each container has a unique ID. So, when the container dies and comes back some other place, it gets the same unique ID. So, then the topology master knows, oh, this container has come up in a different place. It will reform a new physical plan. And that physical plan again is stored in the Zookeeper cluster. And that physical plan is again broadcasted to everybody so that people, uh, the other containers who are talking to this container, they also don't know whether where this guy is running, right? So they can reconnect and uh, start the data exchange. And during the process that it happens, the data is buffered in the other container on the other container so that the moment this container comes up, the data is kind of dumped into this container so that they can process it. Okay, so any other questions before I move forward? Good. Uh, so um, then, uh, one of the highlights of Heron is uh, we introduced this notion of a back pressure. So what happens in the case if uh, one of the instance or the process is running slow? So so there. Uh, let us take a simple uh, topology which is very linear, uh, where you have only single spout which in turn goes to bolt B2, and that in turn feeds to B3 and B4 and so on. So now. Uh, a physical plan when it runs in containers, it looks like this, where you have three instances of each one of them. And uh, so, so all the stream managers are connected to each other as a fully connected graph because uh, data has to exchange. So let us say for example, <coughs> sorry. So now let us say like if uh, you were uh, a B2 is going slow. So now the moment B2 is going slow, the stream manager on the container will identify that I'm not able to push the data as fast as I, could, I want to. And uh, so which means I need to slow it down. So now there are multiple ways of slowing it down. One is uh, if I know who are all feeding into the, uh, what do you call the bolt B2, I can slow them down or I can go to the source. Because if you look at it like in a big topology, ultimately the sources or the, or the spouts are the ones which are continuously injecting data into the whole uh, topology. So now the question is like, uh, uh, so what we did is we took a simplistic approach where rather than going to the previous stage and slowing them down, then uh, back pressure propagates to all the way to the source, we directly go to the source. 
so that we can slow down the source. The moment, uh, what do you call a uh, one instance is uh, known to go slow. So what happens is like uh, the steam manager sends uh, some kind of a broadcast messages. The guy who is experiencing the back pressure or detecting the back pressure will uh, send a message to across all the steam managers saying that, hey, by the way, I'm, uh, I have a, a slow worker here or a slow instance. Can everybody slow down? The moment everybody receives it, uh, back pressure messages, the they will look at in their plan whether they have the notion of a spout because spouts are ultimately the sources of data, right? If there is a spout, then uh, they will not take any more data from the spout at all. So which means that is equivalent to kind of shutting the data flow into the topology. So which means all the data that is in transient in topologies is going at the pace so that uh, the buffers are being drained before we let any more data. So now what happens? Uh, 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 when do you reopen the spouts? So we have this uh, stream manager has his notion of buffers and uh, watermarks on those buffers. Uh, so what happens is if uh, uh, the back pressure is initiated, if the buffer crosses a higher watermark, so that. Um, you can initiate the back pressure. Now, when the buffer is being drained and you want it to go below the lower uh, water, uh, th water threshold watermark, then we initiate a relief back pressure. The moment you relieve the back pressure, then every spout starts sending data again. Uh, so the reason why we have this high, and water, uh, high watermark and low watermark is because of the fact that uh, you don't want to go into an oscillating behavior. So, for example, if you don't have this watermark and you have only one uh, uh, threshold, when it exceeds, you can initiate. When it goes below, you can go down to uh, what you call uh, relieve the back pressure. But the thing is, like then it can go into an oscillating situation. So that we found uh, in uh, when we got Heron into production, we experienced all these things. Then only we did this low watermarks and high watermarks, so that you have some cushion before we can relieve the, actually the back pressure. So again, remember the back pressure. So then to summarize uh, about what Heron is, like uh, uh, Twitter runs around uh, close to 500 plus jobs on Heron all the time, and it processes over 500 billion events per day. And it, the latency of a topology can go from around uh, 50 to 10 millisecond to 50 milliseconds. So some of the uh, sample topologies can range anywhere from very simple ones to complex ones. So do hand people uh, people code these uh, complex topologies at the spout and the bolt level? No, there are higher level frameworks which in turn generate these DAGs and when they generate these DAGs, they might not be even optimizing the DAGs. So just generate the DAGs and dump this DAG into Heron for execution and we are able to execute. So this is a kind of a, gives an high idea of a Heron visualization and uh, the reason why we have to give uh, some uh, uh, level of visualization is because of the fact that uh, we believe in what you call self-service model. I mean, uh, there are 60 teams that are using it. So we are a one small team which needs to support all the 60 teams. So that's, uh, we cannot scale that much actually. So what happens is like uh, we give all the enough necessary tools for the team so that they can troubleshoot the topologies themselves. So the UI is kind of geared towards that. So you can uh, uh, visually see your topology, how it looks like, and how it's mapped into the containers at runtime. And also you can uh, you get a dashboard which says that uh, whether everything is green or not. If it is something is, uh, let us say, for example, GC is causing some issues. And it can even say whether it has happened in the last 10 minutes or one hour or the last three hours. And the moment you click on the particular red button, it can even show what uh, container or what instance what caused that issue so there could be not only one of them it could be multiple of them so that then uh, they can even go down to that instance and look at the logs and what triggered the GCs and other thing so all we have to do this because you don't want to spend a lot of time troubleshooting others uh, uh, problems right because it just doesn't scale so the UI is geared towards uh, doing that actually so, okay, so now uh, with the uh, introduction to Heron, then I want to go into the, what are the common practical issues that we face when in operations. So there are two sets of issues. One is uh, developer facing issues, and the other one is uh, operational issues. So let us look at developer issues. Now, uh, when you write your topology, the simple question is, how do you assign I need uh, 10 instances of this pod and uh, 100 instances of this bolt. So that is one big uh, question. So that's what called the parallelism tuning. Uh, so how do we do that today? It's very manual at this point. So what happens is people write the topology and uh, they try to uh, run it in dev mode 
and in development mode then they have a remember the metrics manager that i talked about that gives you like hundreds of metrics they look at how much cpu is being used at every stage and how much memory is being utilized every stage they look at graphs and charts and all the various stuff uh, then they come out uh, manually saying that no this is not enough then they increase the parallelism then try it so in order to keep iterating that quickly enough it takes almost a week or two weeks before they settle on optimized uh, resource allocation because there are some data variations that happen during the time of the day or during the week, uh, weekends and weekdays and all the various stuff. You have to uh, optimize for those as well. Once that is uh, optimal resource figure is figured out, it takes a couple of weeks manually. Then after that, uh, they multiply it by three or five times before they launch the job. Because the reason why is uh, sometimes you get spikes. I mean spikes, the only way you can do is either you can buffer it or over provision it at that point. So when you allocate 3x, 4x resources, it's that resources are actually wasted actually. Because I've seen like people using 100 cores and they would have allocated around 700 cores, which is like like uh, 600 cores worth of uh, computation is cost. And not only it's uh, cost of uh, the computation, but uh, the power cost, maintenance cost, if you add the math, it's pretty expensive actually. So, so like the first, this thing is, can we automate the fact that, hey, as a developer, I should be just focused on just writing my logic. Or why should I figure out how much resources that I have to do? Can you make it a way by which, okay, like I just write, write it all, launch it, let it figure out what it needs. Then uh, there are common operational issues, and this is like uh, we deal with every day. Uh, slow hosts. I mean, like uh, typically in a large cluster, like because uh, Twitter had these clusters where, uh, where uh, the computation clusters will consist of around uh, uh, 200,000 machines. And uh, those 200,000 machines, I'm sure they will find some bad apples somewhere around. So, so what happens is like uh, sometimes those hosts will be slow, and uh, then uh, network will experience some kind of issues. Then, uh, of course, you will get into data skew because suddenly when there's a spike and some data is growing organically and you have no clue why the uh, skew started suddenly. And uh, Twitter is known for a skew, especially like uh, when there is a, a, what do you call asymmetric medium, right? When Trump tweets, 30 million followers get it. Similarly, like uh, some other popular, uh, I think Katy Perry has the highest, I think, 100 million followers, I think. So when she tweets, 100 million suddenly happens, right? So it's known for data skew. And also load variations. So during the time of the day, uh, data uh, increases in uh, uh, incoming data increases around 10 a.m. Then uh, peaks it around 10:30 or so. Then starts going down. Then again around 4 o'clock it will start again. So again inter-data variations and across data variations. And during Super Bowl and uh, like Oscars time, typically we get 4x to 5x increase in traffic. And uh, there are some occasions where we have seen and there is a Japanese cotton movie. And uh, in Japan, Twitter is being wide, you, widely used, actually. So the story was that um, in uh, in that uh, one of the cotton movies, when one character says something, everybody tweets at the time. So we have seen 100x spike during that time. <laughs> <laughs> In the movie, uh, when the character says uh, one uh, phrase or whatever at one particular scene, everybody is just waiting to hit the send in the tweet button. <laughs> yes, yes, in broadcast. Like so you get 100x. We measured it actually. <laughs> Again, so like they say, hey, don't tweet this. Mm. And then like, in the movie, like, how, what's the, like, everyone knows to tweet this thing. Yeah. I'm, I'm, this no, no, it's not, we are not tweeting. It's a, for them, it's either become a more of a cultural thing or a tradition. In, in the movie, is it, are they, I mean, this is not technical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in the movie, is it like, the guys talking about Twitter? No, it, I, I, it's not, I don't know that because it's Japanese, right? Yeah, so. We should find this out. Yeah, we should find this out, yes. It's a memorable thing. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So the, the, this was uh, kind of the, uh, I mean, we used to experience all kind of issues like that. Then finally, SLA violations. We want to make sure that we don't violate any of those SLAs. So slow host. So why a host is slow? Okay, so some memory parity errors, some uh, disk is might be failing to its impending failures, and it's showing signs of failures, and uh, it could be lower, just lower gigahertz because uh, in a 200,000 node cluster there will be some uh, older machines versus newer machines and if you're unfortunately one part of your container got scheduled into the lower machine it might be going slow as well then network so it could be network slowness or even network partitioning so network slowness how it affects 
it delays processing and uh, data starts accumulating because of the fact there is a delay and the timeliness of results is affected too. I mean, uh, you can go from millisecond to a few seconds too, like it might violate the SLAs. Now let's take network partitioning. So there are cases where I don't have any solutions at all. So let us look at uh, different type of network partitionings. What happens if a scheduler cannot talk to topology master? What happens if a topology master cannot talk to a stream manager? <coughs> and what happens when uh, two stream managers are not able to talk to each other? And what happens if a scheduler and a stream manager cannot talk to each other? So these are the various different network partitions that can happen in the system. Now let's take one by one. Scheduler and the topology master, they are not able to talk to each other. So uh, what happens, scheduler thinks that the container has died because it then is not getting any heartbeats from them. So it will try to spawn off a new master container. Now uh, what happens like uh, since uh, the master container has a lock on the zookeeper, the one which is currently running, which is not able, to, which the scheduler is not able to contact, then acquiring a mastership on the, um, uh, the zookeeper topology name is going to fail on the new master container. So the master container will keep retrying, trying and dies. So which is fine actually because of the fact that uh, at least this network partitioning is not affecting the topology that is currently running. But the one, the, it will affect only if the topology master container dies and the scheduler has to know, right? At the time, uh, you don't have, in this case, they don't even have to know because of the fact that uh, it's a spawn of a new master container anyway, right? At the time, that will pick it up. So if the master container dies, it will go into a mode of where scheduler will keep trying to schedule again and again until the network partitioning comes back into uh, what they call either got relieved or probably got to a point that it that it require operator invention or whatever. How many of you, by the way, have we seen network partitioning? We see one uh, one per week at least. <laughs> it happens. It happens. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, but the thing is, when you experience it, like uh, then only you will realize when it experiences it uh, has a different symptoms of uh, coming together, and you have no clue that the network partitioning has occurred until you go to really down go to news, oh, there is a network partitioning happening somewhere. So then what happens in the case between topology master and the stream manager occurs? So in this case, the team master thinks that the data container has died and wait for the scheduler to reschedule a, a new data container and uh, that never happens because uh, of the fact that the scheduler thinks that uh, the other data container is fine, right? So, which means nothing affected in this case. Now, what happens to the case when the stream manager and team manager, where the data exchanges are actually happening, network partitioning happens. So, they cannot talk to each other, cannot exchange data because of the network partitioning, and the data is buffering on the increasing on the stream manager. At some point, it's going to dump the data off because they are overflowing the buffers. <laughs> and after that, it's a chaos. We have to detect this network partition. In this case, I have no clue what to do with that network partitioning. Then uh, in the other case where between scheduler and the stream manager, so this case, again, a new data container is spawned and team master realizes that two containers are reporting that, uh, hey, I'm the same guy, right? Because uh, the one data container is able to not able to talk, but uh, so then, but uh, the team master, what happens is like uh, when a new uh, data container comes up saying I am the exist uh, uh, guy who's already existing, then it will never accept that connection. That way we can keep running the topology. There are pros and cons to accepting the new guy versus the old guy, but we decide to choose the old guy because the old guy might be accumulated some state and other things which you don't want to disturb. So now data skew. Again, there are two different type of data skews. One is uh, several keys map into a single instance and their counters could be very high, which is a multiple key data issue. Of course, the another skew is based on single key where a single key maps into a single instance and the count is high too. So in multi keys, one simple way to solve the problem is like, uh, as you have this topology, let, let us say like uh, bolt one is the one which is experiencing the uh, lot of data coming through it. Then we can just simply increase the parallelism on the fly, right? So if you can scale up the number of instances on the bolt alone, you should be able to absorb the processing of the data increase that is happening there. Now, what do you do in the case of single keys? Anybody? Cache. 
cache is the partial solution. So what you typically do is do a pre-aggregation stage. So one simple way to do a uh, way, way to do is is like uh, uh, when a single key is uh, getting into a single instances, you do have to have some kind of pre-aggregation uh, thing so that it reduces the number of tuples that is going from that stage to the next stage. So what happens if the skew is temporary that causes issue? Do you introduce a stage on and off every time, or just keep that all the time? Again, these are interesting issues. So now, the second level, finally, is the load variations. You can get into spikes, or it could be daily uh, organically varying patterns. So these are the two different load variations. So now, I've, I've looked at, I've kind of enumerated all the problems and other things that happen. These things happen, we have seen it in our eyes, and how can we kind of come up with a solution or a framework which can allow to solve these problems in some fashion. So again, this is a very preliminary work that uh, we have started with, and uh, it's <coughs> essentially we call them as autopiloting or self-regulating. So, so what is mean by autopiloting? So uh, there are a couple of uh, broad areas. So one is uh, how to ma automate the manual and time-consuming and error-prone task of tuning. Remember the developer problem of tuning, allocating container resources, how to automate them, and uh, how to, what do you mean by automation? So in the sense like even if you define automation, you need to have a, some kind of a goal in order to satisfy. And that goal is expressed in terms of service level objective, eh? saying that, hey, this topology has to maintain this throughput irrespective of these environment changes, or it has to maintain this particular amount of latency uh, independent of how the environment is, right? So that is an objective that the system will try to achieve all the time and retune itself in some fashion to achieve this objective. Then, uh, maintaining that objective uh, in the face of unpredictable load variations, so on the hardware and software issues. And this is what you know, essentially constitutes the autopiloting of the steaming systems. Now, what does it mean for autopiloting means? There are three different broad, uh, this thing underlying, uh, that supports autopiloting. First is self-tuning, in the sense like uh, several tuning knobs, and uh, we wanted to uh, reduce the amount of time that is going into a consuming phase. And the uh, system essentially should to take an uh, SLO as an objective, then automatically configure the knobs, which is very similar to uh, some of the research uh, the database team is doing out here, which is essentially automating the knobs so that you don't have to worry about uh, tuning the database. Which, which is in, in uh, very it's very similar in the steaming systems as well. Then uh, the notion of self stabilizing, especially the steaming jobs are long running because uh, so there are several cases where people just uh, launch a job and forget it for six months and come back. Hey, nothing happened. Uh, so why you should I take it out? Uh, we have to go and force them, saying that hey, by the way, the software has evolved over a period of time. We have fixed a bunch of bugs and everything. Can you please relaunch your job because it, you have to launch with a new version, right? So uh, so and. Uh, some of the things are load variations are very common, which because of the predictable nature of the traffic and sometimes unexpected hikes as well. So the system should uh, uh, react to external shocks and uh, accordingly adjust itself. And finally, it should do self-healing in the sense of in the presence of things like software issues and hardware issues, you should be able to identify those issues and automatically correct itself. So these are the th three different areas of uh, uh, what an autopiloting should achieve. So how do we achieve it? So like, uh, so uh, by working with Microsoft, we designed a system called uh, Dalian. And Dalian is essentially a nothing but as a policy-based framework integrated into Heron. So essentially, you can uh, describe a policy for each of the issues, and it will continue to evaluate this policy every few minutes or so, and accordingly, it will readjust the topology based on the, how the conditions change. So essentially, it uh, executes some well-defined policies uh, that optimize the execution based on some objective. And uh, so we also, uh, I will also show a couple of top, uh, policies that uh, uh, shows how you, you can scale up and scale down and how to identify slow host and a few things like that. Uh, so, so we have just started uh, with two policies, but uh, this gives you an extensible framework where you can write more and more policies and, uh, and based on those, you can solve a bunch of other issues that you have come up with. Or uh, for example, you can direct the skew and what you can do to solve the skew. That could be a policy on its own itself, right? 
So this is a very extensible uh, architecture. So what are the uh, Dolian policy phases? So Dolian essentially takes the metrics that we collect. Remember we had the metrics manager in each container, right? Which is constantly measuring uh, uh, information about uh, how the each uh, instance is performing in terms of latency, throughput, a number of tuples emitted, how much is the queue length. You, what are the metrics that uh, you can think of is pretty much there. So these metrics are constantly ingested into Dolion and uh, then uh, uh, each of these metric combinations is used to detect symptoms. So what are the symptoms that is going the topology is experiencing at this point in time. Then uh, these symptoms are fed into uh, some kind of uh, diagnostic generators which in turn uh, takes a combination of these symptoms and produces some uh, with confidence hey, this is the diagnostics I am thinking of. Then once you have uh, some kind of diagnostics then you ought to have some kind of uh, actions that you wanted to take to resolve that actually. So how do you automatically resolve it? So there could be a non-invasive, uh, uh, so some of the, the policy could be, overall could be invasive policy or non-invasive policy. An invasive policy is actually, it's going to change something in the structure of the topology during execution. So which means uh, uh, it is going to affect the topologies in some way, right? And a non-invasive policy does not affect anything. Instead, it just reports to a user this is happening. Uh, so an invasive policy, when it's taking some kind of a resolving action or a corrective action, so typically we make sure that we just do one invasive action at any given time because it's just for uh, purposes because uh, if there are multiple uh, resolving actions are happening simultaneously you don't know how they are interacting with each other they, they might even what do you call break the topology rather than correcting it in some fashion right so that's why invasive policies are done one at a time and uh, and between two invasive policies there is some amount of time is given so that uh, uh, we see once the policy is applied then uh, whether the corrective action that that policy took is uh, beneficial or not if it is not beneficial then uh, uh, then we go on to the next one so that way like what happens is you don't uh, uh, globber the topology in some fashion so now like uh, how did the Dolian was incorporated into Heron? So it's pretty straightforward. So the in the topology master container, we have this notion of health manager, which is actually a Dolian implementation. And uh, all the metrics manager, remember Dolian requires all the metrics. Uh, uh, pipe those metrics into health manager and the health manager runs these policies every two minutes by caching those metrics and looking at what happened in the last 10 minutes or what happened in the last 20 minutes so that it doesn't go into some kind of transient noisy data, right? Uh, so then um, executes those policies. Now. Uh, once execute the policies, uh, then it takes corrective actions. Then it also logs what action it is taking at this any given point, so that uh, we can see uh, what is that the action is taking place because of what diagnostics, because of what metrics, so that we have an explanation of why it did that, right? Because this is very important to in troubleshooting itself or troubleshooting Dolly on itself. Then, um, then uh, if some action did not, uh, what do you call, uh, lead to some kind of a correction that was uh, resolve the issue. Uh, uh, then uh, we blacklist that action in the sense like hey this uh, action did not uh, uh, resolve whatever it's supposed to resolve so we blacklist it so that you know which one worked and which one did not work in this conditions right and that is in turn helps Dalian to improve itself. So let's look at a concrete example of uh, what we call as a dynamic resource provisioning. So this is a policy reacts to unexpected uh, load weight. This remember one of the problem that we mentioned is to how to uh, deal with load variations, right? So in this case, like uh, this policy is supposed to correct uh, the topology when a load variation occur. So the goal here is to either to scale up or scale down the topology resources as needed, while the topology until the topology achieves a steady state where back pressure is not uh, observed. Because back pressure means uh, there are three issues. One is either a slow host problem, or it could be the topology is not provisioned correctly, uh, or it could be some kind of data skew. So now, uh, if you take the dynamic resource policies, it. Uh, takes the metrics and tries to detect three things. One is the pending tuples detector, which kind of uh, indicates either a slow or whatever it is, or the back pressure detector, whether are you ob observing any back pressure in the topology at all. Then the third one is like a uh, processing rate, how fast I'm processing for uh, the skew. So once the detectors are uh, come up with some kind of a symptom that they are uh, uh, experiencing, it could be possible all the symptoms could be all three of them simultaneously occurring as well. Then uh, we go through the resource, uh, whether 
uh, what is a diagnostic? It could be a resource over provisioning that we need to increase or we need to scale down the resources because the topology is taking more resources or it could be data skewed de detectors or it could be even slow instances because of the fact that uh, there's some correlation between the processes that are running on that container that everything is going slow that that container has to be moved to a different uh, machine itself. Right. So once we uh, find the appropriate diagnostics, then we go into what you call uh, um, either do, do a bold scale up or bold scale down or a, uh, it's, a, it's a data skew resolver or restart the instances or restart the container somewhere else. Right. So now let me give me an example of the, let's take this simple topology and this is running at a steady state where uh, for the splitter bolt where it is doing around 100 tuples per uh, uh, tuples per second and its queue size is around 20. Now let's say like uh, uh, take the case where it's under provision. So suddenly you will see like uh, you will see like uh, the topology is under provision because most of the splitters uh, spouts are receiving more data than what we are supposed to process and one of the guys started experiencing back pressure because he's not able to handle that data right if all its peers are experiencing at most at the uh, same uh, topology processing rate and also have the approximately the same q size then you know in that stage is not uh, uh, it's taking more data than what it can process. So which means automatically it should increase the uh, this thing. So which means uh, totally the topology is under provision. So which means we need to increase the resources. Now let us get back to a steady state. Now let us look at the slow instance case. Now, uh, so what happens in the slow instance is like uh, the guy who is going slow is not able to absorb the data or process the data as fast as it could. So it will initiate the back pressure. Now, remember we uh, I talked about the back pressure where we go and clamp down the source directly, right? Now, because of the fact that we have gone and clamped down on the source, uh, the rate of uh, tuples ingested into a topology itself is slows down. So which means everybody will be getting the same rate of tuples per second. Now, but uh, the guy who is actually slow will have more Q depth or Q size, which means that indicates that uh, that container is experiencing slowness, yes. Shouldn't also the processing rate of the guy who is slow be lower? Uh, the, no, it need not be because of the, when we observe in practice, because of the back pressure has already occurred, there is no more data flow into the topology, right? Whatever the existing data is only is being distributed across all the guys. So which means, yeah. right? So that's why you see the 50-50 on both of them. So that's uh, that's why I explained the back pressure in the front. Mm -hmm. So that means the slow data in these things. Now let's look at the data skew, how the numbers will look like. So in this case, uh, you will have a board processing rate as well as a queue depth. So which means you know there is some data skews that is occurring there. We don't know whether it's a single key or a multi key, but at least you know that this is occurring there. So this is how you, the uh, diagnostics uh, comes up. So once the diagnostics comes up, then you have to get the appropriate action. So typically diagnostics and actions are kind of mapped one to one. So this is an example of another policies, but I'm not going to go into the details of this, but because in the interest of time. So this is essentially meaning the, uh, you can even describe a topology saying that, hey, maintain the throughput for me. Like this throughput should be 100,000 tuples per second. Make it happen independent of uh, however the changes occur in the environment, right? So that's what this one does. So now to just to give an idea about the how it works, um, so we tried it with uh, one simple topology where they spout and a splitter bolt and a counter bolt. So it, this is a tweet spout which gets uh, data split into, in the tweet data gets split into the splitter bolt and then we count the uh, words on the other one. So then the hardware, this was tested with Microsoft HD Insight and with all the various stuff. The throughput of the, this thing is number of tuples emitted per minute. Throughput of the bolts is number of tuples emitted over one minute and number of in, uh, heron instance provisions. So it's a little bit uh, this thing. So in this graph, if you look at like uh, 
you have the steady state uh, S1, which this is a normalized throughput where the S1 state is uh, considered as 100%. And uh, then we scale it down 20%. Then we see whether uh, Dalian has reduced the resources or not. So whenever uh, uh, the topology is reconfiguring itself, you will see the throughput going down. This is the small spikes that you see, which means topology is reconfiguring itself uh, so that uh, it can come back to the normal state, right? So with, uh, doing that uh, spike down and all, it's actually the number of instances is increasing or decreasing, those kind of things, and the topology is correcting itself. So then uh, uh, it took, uh, once you uh, have the steady state, then the scale down, it took some time to scale it down as you detected that 20% uh, reduction in the throughput. Um, the number of instances of uh, some of the uh, splitter bolt and the counter bolt decreased and uh, until it reaches a steady state of S2. Uh, it has to go through, but remember, uh, if you scale down one, you can scale down another uh, uh, stage as well, right? Because remember the topology is a DAG of stages, right? And that's why you see a first slowdown and a, or a first spike to adjust one stage. Remember at any given time, invasive policy can be one at a time, right? So then you stabilize that uh, for some amount of time. Then if there is an opportunity to go down further, you go down further. So the overall it took like around 10 or 20 minutes to reach a stable state, right? So now, uh, then again, we uh, increase the throughput by another 30 percent, uh, 20% to 30%, right? Now, let us see how uh, the topology can uh, adjust it, its scale up and uh, reaches a stable state, right? So it took again another uh, uh, 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, the thing is like uh, it uh, went through three scale ups in order to reach that steady state again, uh, say S3. So like it's able to follow the adjusted topology as the time goes on, right? So, the so policy can auto correct itself and uh, resolve bottlenecks even on multi stage topologies. Remember, when you have a long stages, it takes uh, multiple steps in order to correct this topology because uh, because one stage will in turn uh, trigger a back pressure in another stage, then you measure it, then you trigger another stage and all. But uh, there are room for a lot of improvements. For example, if we can find out uh, within a DAG, there is a lot of correlation between uh, some of the elements in the DAG. When you increase one, automatically you can increase other and all. But we have not done any of those things yet. So this one is uh, kind of uh, uh, is, uh, kind of showing. Actually, I wish I had put these two graphs side by side. It would have been nice. Um, it essentially means like uh, uh, how the number of bowls and uh, uh, has been increased and decreased uh, during that state changes that you have seen, right? So that's what it shows. The red is essentially showing the counter bolt during the scale down. The number of uh, bolt instances went down uh, during before it reaches S2. It went down by a couple of instances down. Uh, on the other hand, when the uh, scale up went, it uh, jumped from around uh, 9 or uh, 8 to around 14 or so. So the number of instances are being adjusted automatically. So it's gradually scaled up and down. So that's much, pretty much I had. But I mean, like, um, uh, again, Dalian is just an initial set of work. There's a lot of things to be done. If anybody is interested in uh, working on this, let me know so I can give you all the pointers whatever you would like to. So of course then uh, to conclude, autopiloting is important uh, and the key issues that we are trying to solve is uh, tuning and uh, slow host problems, network and data skew. And you're not even touched as you can see in the network partitioning issues, even network slowness. I mean network slowness could be emitting symptoms in terms of diff different these things. And especially like in a cloud provider like AWS, the internal network is very uh, not predictable. Sometimes you can get the right throughput, sometimes it might not. And in fact, like uh, uh, Google runs Heron in one of the teams, uh, Google Fabric team. And uh, those guys have done some adjustments where they're uh, not at the system level, they have done it at a little bit uh, at the topology level where if the throughput is uh, going down on one direction, they will read out to the other direction and all. So, but uh, we are trying to get their work done and more into the system level kind of uh, these things. So any other questions? Mm -hmm. I go back to slide to the uh, throughput and time graph, like uh, there are some spikes in the... Yes. So um, my question is, um, 
because I see uh, the spikes in down, so no, the spike, the spike is it? Oh, so the, the question is like uh, in the graph that I showed earlier about the, the dynamic policy positioning, uh, why did the throughput go down, right? Yes, yeah, so the, the spikes, <coughs> uh, there's the, uh, the spike means uh, it is the overhead of uh, adjusting the topology. At that time, the, when the topology is adjusting itself, it's not processing any data. So that's why you see the throughput down at that point. So, because a corrective action is being taken at that point, that's why the data processing is not happening at that point. So, that is a, so it clearly distinguishes what time that action is happening and at that time the data processing is very minimal. So, that is why you see the throughput down. But after that, the moment the action is finished, then it picks up directly wherever it has to. So, it takes some amount of time to stabilize itself. So, um, if these overhead because I see the scale is in so like uh, the overhead uh, I wish the 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 what do you call it the width of this overhead like should be much smaller like in probably in milliseconds I would prefer but currently it is not there yet but uh, because of the fact that for example if I have to allocate a new container the scheduler is overhead right so I mean there are possible improvements by which we can make this very transient uh, I mean, we don't have to even come in, uh, go down because currently uh, the back pressure means like uh, we stop the data essentially, right? During the corrective action before we reopen, right? So essentially, like uh, the spouts are stopped and they recorrect the topology and then open up the gates, right? So we could be able to do uh, as the data is in transit and change the stuff as well, but we have not done that yet. Okay. Yeah. Time for one question. Uh -huh. You mentioned that only one policy is executed at one point of time. One invasive policy at any given. Okay, have you, like, is there a limitation or have you guys just not explored why you can't run multiple policies? No, not, we have not uh, actually uh, tried making invasive, because the reason why we thought like one invasive policy at a time is to kind of uh, learn about, because then one action could be enough because you remember there are a lot of uh, interrelated stuff that could uh, one action could cause other reactions right so we wanted to do one action watch for other reactions then take the other actions right instead of uh, taking multiple action then multiplying the reactions quite a bit right so i think so, that's actually a very good idea mm -hmm. this looks like an expert system and normally as you increase the number of policies the number of could be increased exponentially and we don't know idea because we don't want ultimately we want to keep the maintaining the topologies as good as it can rather than making it worse and right so all right next time you talk one last time thank you all right so the next speaker for the time series davis lectures will be uh, october 12th we'll have super gold from two sigma two sigma is a big hedge fund in uh, new york city and apparently they're building two time series databases so he's going to come and talk about at least one all right, thanks guys.